Hare Krishna, welcome to today's Srimad Bhagavatam class. Before we start Srimad Bhagavatam class, let's do a simple Mangala Chanana. Om Namo Bhagate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagate Vasudevaya. Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaim Narotamam Deving Saraswati Vyasam Tato Jayamudi Rayat. Before reciting Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the only means of conquest, let us offer our respectful obeisances to the personality of Godhead Lord Narayana. On to Nara, Nara and Arisha, the supermost human being. On to Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning. And on to Srila Vyasadeva, the author of Srimad Bhagavatam. Nasa Paresha, Vadareshu, Nityam Bhagavata Se, Vaya, Bhagavate Uttama, Sloke, Bhaktir, Bhavadi, Naistikehi. By regularly attending Srimad Bhagavatam class and by rendering service to the lotus feet of pure devotees, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely vanquished. And loving devotional service onto the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental song, is established in one's heart as an irrevocable fact. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Jnana Salakaya Chakshura Anmadatanyana Tasmai Sri Guru Venamaha I was born in the darkness of ignorance and my spiritual master illuminated my heart with the torch of transcendental knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisance onto him. Nama Om Vishnu Padai Krishna Paristai Putale Srimite Japataka Swami Tinamni Nama Acharya Padaini Tai Kripa Padaini Gora Katadam Dai Nargram Tani Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vranda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Welcome everyone to today's Srimad Bhagavatam class. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 24, Chapter entitled The Philosophy of Sankhya. So this chapter is the continuation from a conversation between Krishna and Uddhava uh, in a section of Srimad Bhagavatam called Uddhava Gita. So the last uh, chapter we heard about the, the glorious uh, pastime of the Avanti Brahmana. And this Avanti Brahmana um, is a story told by Krishna to Uddhava to uh, emphasize and, and to illustrate the point whereby Krishna gave a, a very, very important instruction. That is, to keep sense gratification far, far away from our consciousness. And uh, in, uh, to, to elaborate further this, uh, this instruction, Krishna told the story of the Avanti Brahmana. The Avanti Brahmana, the lesson learned in the Avanti Brahmana is that uh, whether we, we, uh, we consider something good or bad, uh, pain or suffering is all the conclusion of our mind only. Uh, this is the conclusion of the uh, Avanti Brahmana. And this Avanti Brahmana, he dedicated his life to performing uh, activities that are in the... Uh, uh, the, the, the Cast of a sannyasi. So that that chapter was a very illuminating chapter. So now Krishna is going to give instruction on how bewilderment of the mind can be dispelled by the signs of sankhya. So sankhya here is the uh, <clears throat> analytical study of the world around us. The purpose why Krishna wanted to um, uh, talked about this philosophy of sankhya is because uh, where, uh, uh, for those who are too addicted to sense gratification, they are addicted to fruitive activities, they see everything around them as an opportunity to enjoy sense, sense gratification. So the only way to dispel it, the only way to clear this illusion is by hearing about the Sankhya philosophy. Uh, the Sankhya philosophy details out how this world was created, what was the uh, process of creation, and, and at the same time, it explains what is the process of annihilation, of absorption, actually. Nothing is, is annihilated. Nothing is destroyed. Everything is absorbed back into uh, Krishna. So, this uh, chapter uh, is very, very technical. But uh, I can tell you from experience that first time hearing this philosophy, it's, it is difficult. But as you hear it again and again, it is so powerful and so purifying that you actually understand now why uh, pure devotees of the Lord, they say, everything is Krishna, everything is Krishna, Vasudevam Sarvam Iti. You begin to understand it clear, clearer. So let's begin with the first text, text number one. Lord 
Sri Krishna said, Now I shall describe to you the science of Sankhya which has been perfectly established by ancient authorities. By understanding this science, a person can immediately give up the illusion of material dualities. Text number 2 Originally, during the Karta Yoga, when all men were very expert in spiritual discrimination, and also previous to that, during the period of annihilation, the seers existed alone, non-different from the seen objects. So here, Karta Yoga here is referring to Satya Yoga. In Satya Yoga, the human beings, they were all very enlightened and uh, not bewildered, uh, like we are today in Kali Yoga. In Kali Yoga, everybody is confused. With so many theories and so many uh, um, uh, ideas and all that. So in Satya Yoga, there was no such speculation. Whatever ideas they had in their mind was perfectly fitting reality. And nobody wasted their time in arguing with one another and speculating. So that is Satya Yoga. So uh, and in this verse also, there is mentioned here, the seer exists alone, non-different from the seen objects. This is referring to Krishna. Uh, Krishna, when when he uh, creates this material for the for the pleasure actually for the pleasure of the living entities, so the living entities could fulfill their 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 desires to become enjoyers. This same Krishna, when he unwinds everything uh, back up into himself, he absorbs everything back into himself. When he absorbs everything, there is no uh, uh, us and them. There is no uh, objects and, uh, and sense objects. There is no dualities. There is no nothing. So everything becomes one with Krishna. So that's what it means by seer exists alone, non-different from the seen objects. Text number three. That one absolute truth remaining free from the material dualities and inaccessible to ordinary speech and mind divided himself into two categories. The material nature and the living entities who are trying to enjoy the manifestation of that nature. So now Krishna is explaining about the process of creation. Uh, he expands from himself various things that create that the, this material world that we see around us. Text number four. Of these two categories the, of manifestation, one is material nature, which embodies both the subtle cause and manifests products of matter. The other is the conscious living entity designated as the enjoyer. Text number five. When material nature is agitated by my glance, the three material modes, goodness, passion and ignorance, becomes manifested to fulfill the pending desires of the conditioned soul. So here the Lord, he cast his glance over material nature to agitate uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Mahatattva so that the conditioned souls have not worked out their chain of fruitive activities and mental speculation and that creation is therefore again necessary for the conditioned souls to get the opportunity to become Krishna conscious in love of Godhead uh, by understanding the futility of life without the Lord. The modes of nature arise after the glance of the Lord and become inimical to one another. Each one of these modes, uh, modes of goodness, passion, ignorance, they are constantly fighting with one another. Although, uh, see, there's an example here, although a child desires to take birth, the cruel mother may desire to kill the child through abortion. Although we may desire to kill the wheat in a field, they stubbornly take birth again and again. Similarly, we often desire to maintain our physical status quo, but still deteriorate, deterioration sets in. So these are actually examples of how the modes are constantly working against each other. You know, the mode of goodness is trying to overcome the mode of passion. The mode of passion is trying to overcome the mode of ignorance. The mode of ignorance is trying to overcome the mode of goodness like this. So this is manifested in how we see things are happening around us. Some, we don't want suffering, but suffering comes in, in, in our lives. Uh, we don't want to, uh, we, have, we don't want to have difficulty, but difficulty come in, in, in our lives. Thus, there is constant competition among the modes of nature and by their combination and permutation, the living entities try to enjoy innumerable material situations without Krishna consciousness. The Lord sets the stage for such material facilities so that the conditioned soul will eventually come back home back to Godhead. 
So the purpose behind the creation of this material world is so that uh, all of us, we get to finish what we want to come here to do. We satisfy our desire and then we take to Krishna consciousness in all seriousness. Uh, when we take to Krishna consciousness with all seriousness, then we finish our business here and go back home, back to Godhead. Text number six. From these modes arise the primeval sutra along with the Mahatattva. By the transformation of the Mahatattva was generated the false ego, the cause of the living entity's bewilderment. So here, sutra is the first transformation of the material nature that manifests the potency of activity. And it is accompanied by Mahatattva, which is endowed with the potency of knowledge. In the material world, one's real knowledge is covered by fruitive activities and mental speculation. The real, one's real knowledge here is that one's an eternal servant of Krishna. We forget this when we come into this material world. As one's devotional service to the Lord slackens, these two tendencies grow automatically, just as the diminishing of light automatically brings an increase in darkness. So all of us who have had a little bit of experience in life, we know that whenever we become less disciplined in our, our, our endeavors, what happens is a lot of mental speculation and, and a lot of criticism uh, happen in our life. Uh, we will fill our consciousness with all kinds of excuses. Text number seven. False ego, which is the cause of physical sensation, the senses and the mind, encompass both spirit and matter and manifest in their varieties in the more of goodness, passion and ignorance. So here the false ego is the illusory combination of the eternal conscious soul and the temporary unconscious body. Because the spirit soul desires to exploit illicitly the creation of God, he is bewildered by the three modes of nature and assumes an illusory identity within the material world. Struggling to enjoy, he becomes more and more entangled in the complexities of illusion and only increases his anxiety. This hopelessness situation can be overcome by taking to pure Krishna consciousness, in which the pleasure of the Supreme Lord becomes the only goal of one's life. Text number 8. From false ego in the mode of ignorance comes the subtle physical perception, from which the gross elements were generated. From false ego in the mode of passion comes the senses, and from false ego in the mode of ignorance arose the eleven demigods. So here, false ego in the mode of ignorance, sound is generated along with the sense of hearing to perceive it and the sky as a medium. Next, the sensation of touch, air and the sense of touch are generated. And thus, from subtle to gross, all the elements of the perceptions are generated. The senses, because they are busily engaged in activities, are created from false ego in the mode of passion. From false ego in the goodness comes 11 demigods, the deities of directions, the wind, the sun, Varuna, the, Ash, the Ashwini deities, Agni, Indra, Upendra, Mitra, Brahma and Chandra. Text number 9. Impelled by me, all these elements combine to function in an orderly fashion and together give birth to the universal egg, which is my excellent place of residence. Text number 10. I myself appear within that egg, which is floating on the causal water, and from my navel arose the universal lotus, the birthplace of the self-born Lord Brahma. So here the Supreme Lord here describes his appearance in the transcendental pastimes form of Sri Narayana. So Lord Narayana entered within the universe, and uh, but does not give up his purely transcendental body of knowledge and bliss. Lord Brahma, however, born from the Lord's na navel lotus, has a material body. Although Lord Brahma is the most powerful mystic, his body, which pervades all material existence, is material, whereas the body of the Supreme Lord Hari Narayana is always transcendental. Text number 11. Lord Brahma, the soul of the universe, being endowed with the mode of passion, performs great austerities by my mercy and thus creates the three planetary divisions called Bhu, Bhuvar and Swar, along with their presiding deities. Text number 12. 
heaven was established as the residence of the demigods, Bovar Loka as that of the ghostly spirits, and the earthly system as the place of human beings and other mortal creatures. Those mystics who strive for liberation are promoted beyond these three divisions. So planets like Indra Loka and Chandra Loka are meant for heavenly enjoyment of the most pious fruity focus. The highest four planets, however, Satya Loka, Mahar Loka, Jana Loka and Tapa Loka are meant for those who are most perfectly endowed for liberation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is so inconceivably merciful that he promotes the most fallen victims of Kali Yuga beyond these four planets and even beyond Vaikuntha to the supreme planet of Lord Krishna in the spiritual sky called Goloka Vrindavana. Heavens in the residence is of the demigods, the earth is the residence of the human beings and in between is a temporary residence for both the classes of beings. Text number 13. Lord Brahma created the region below the earth for the demons and the nagas, snakes. In this way, the destination of the three worlds were arranged as the corresponding reaction for different kind of work performed within the three modes of nature. So those who are in the mode of ignorance, they end up going to the hellish planets, which is below uh, all this, uh, this uh, creation of Lord uh, Brahma. Text number 14. By mystic yoga, great austerities and the renounced order of life, the pure destination of Maharloka, Janaloka, Taparloka and Satyaloka attain. But by devotion, devotional service, one achieves my transcendental abode. So here, Tapasa, he is referring to austerities performed by Brahmacharis and Vanaprastha. A Brahmachari who practices celibacy perfectly in some practical stage of his life achieves, achieves Maharloka. And one who perfectly practices lifelong celibacy achieves Janaloka. By perfect execution of Vanaprastha, one may achieve Tapaloka and one in the renounced order of life, Sanyasa, goes to Satyaloka. These different destinations certainly depends on one's seriousness in the yoga system. In the third canto of Bhagavatam, Lord Brahma explains to the demigods, the inhabitants of Vaikuntha travel in their airplane made of lapis lazuli, emerald and gold, although crowded by their consorts who have large hips and beautiful smiling faces, they cannot be stimulated to passion by their, by their beauty and charm. So this is in Bhagavatam. Huh? This is what happens in Vaikuntha Loka. Even though they are, they are so beautiful beyond description, they cannot be uh, influenced into lusty desires, which is, which is very common in this material world. Thus, in the spiritual world, the kingdom of God, the inhabitants have absolutely no desire for personal satisfaction since they are completely satisfied in love of Godhead. Because they only think of the Lord's pleasure, there is no possibility of cheating, anxiety, lust, disappointment, and so on. As described in Bhagavad Gita 1862, O Sikona Bharata, surrender unto him utterly. By his grace you will attain the transcendental peace and the supreme and eternal abode. Text number 15. All results of fruitive work have been arranged within this world by me, and the supreme creator acting as the force of time. Thus one sometime rises up towards the surface of this mighty river of the modes of nature and sometime again submerge. So one's promotion to the higher planetary systems, as mentioned in the previous verse, refer to being submerged in a miserable condition of life by impious activities. In both cases, one is drowning within the mighty river of material existence, which carries one far away from one's real home in the kingdom of God. So this is how the mode of material nature, uh, they fight within each, uh, within each of us. Uh, the mode of passion, uh, uh, goodness and ignorance, they're constantly fighting within each of us. And by their influence, we perform activities that promote us to or degrade us down to uh, uh, the different planetary system in different bodies. 8,400,000 species of life. So this is what this verse is talking about here. Text number 16. Whatever feature visible existed within this world, small or great, thin or stout, 
certainly contains both the material nature and its enjoyer, the spirit soul. Text number 17. Gold and earth are originally existing as ingredients. From gold, one may fashion golden ornaments, such as bracelets and earrings, and from earth, one may fashion clay pots and saucers. The original ingredient of gold and earth exists before the product made from them. And when the product are eventually destroyed, the original ingredients, gold and earth, will remain. Thus, since the ingredients are present in the beginning and at the end, they must also be present in the middle phase, taking the form of a particular product to which we assign for convenience a particular name, such as a bracelet, earring, pot or saucer. We can therefore understand that since the ingredients cause existence before the creation of the product and after the product is dis destruction, the same ingredient cause must be present during the manifested state, supporting the product as the basis of its reality. So this verse here actually goes to very much detail uh, where the Lord explains the original cause uh, is certainly present in its effect, citing the example of gold and clay functioning as the cause, in, causal ingredients of many different products in which gold and clay continue to be, pre, to be present. For our convenience, we assign different names to temporary products, although their essential nature continue to be that of the ingredient, not the temporary product. Text number 18. As a material, a material object itself composed of an essential ingredient creates another material object through transformation. Thus, once create objects become, created objects become the cause and basis of another created object. A particular thing may thus be called real in that it possesses the basic nature of another object that constitute its original and final stage. So this, this might sound very, very complicated, but the point here is that before this world is created and before our body is created, there was Krishna. After this world was created and after we, uh, we have embodied this uh, material uh, body, Krishna is within us and he is conducting everything, he is making everything move in this, in this world. And after this world is uh, absorbed and we in this body dies, uh, Krishna is still there with the, with the eternal spirit soul. That is the gist of what is being explained in these three verses. Text number 19. The material universe may be considered real, having nature as its original ingredient and final state. Lord Mahavishnu is the resting place of nature, which becomes manifested by the power of time. Thus nature, the almighty Vishnu and time are not different from me, the supreme absolute truth. So now is a little bit of talking about Mahavishnu and the element of time. Material nature is the energy of the Lord. Mahavishnu is his plenary portion and time represents the Lord's activities. In this way, time and nature are always subserv subservient. They are always serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead who creates, maintains and annihilates all that exists through the agency of his potencies and his energies, the plenary portions. Plenary portions here is referring to the expansion from Krishna, uh, like Mahavishnu, uh, Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu and Shirodaka Shai Vishnu. In all that exists through the agency of his potency, the plenary portion, in other words, Lord Krishna, the absolute truth, because he is contained all existence within himself. Text number 20. As long as the Supreme Personality of Godhead continues to glance upon nature, the material world continues to exist, perpetually manifesting through procreation the great and variegated flow of universal creation. See here, although, although here he is describing Mahatattva, this Mahatattva is actually the energy of the Supreme Lord that is impelled by the force of time. Uh, is the is this Mahatattva is the ingredient of the cause of this world? It clearly explains here that the Supreme Lord is personally the only ultimate cause of all that exists. Now that is the main point here. Time and nature are powerless to act without the glance 
of the personality of Godhead. He creates unlimited material varieties for the sense gratification of the conditioned soul who try to enjoy life as children of a particular parent and as, a, as the parent of a particular children through the 8,400,000 species of life. Text number 21. I am the basis of the universal form which displays endless varieties through the repetition, the creation, maintenance and destruction of planetary system. Originally containing within itself all planets in their dormant state, my universal form manifests the varieties of created existence by arranging the coordinated com in combination of the five elements. Text number 22 to 27. So here Krishna is going to describe how the world is, this universe is uh, absorbed. Not annihilated, but absorbed. Okay. At the time of annihilation, the mortal body of the living beings become merged into food. Food merges, merges into grains and the grains merges back into earth. The earth merges into its subtle sensation. Fragrance. Fragrance merges into water. And water further merges into its own quality taste. That taste merges into fire, which merges into form. Form merges into touch, and touch merges into ether. Ether finally merges into the sensation of sound. And the senses all merge into their own origins, the presiding demigods. And they, O oh gentle Uddhava, merges into the controlling mind, which itself merges into the false ego in the mode of goodness. Sound becomes one with false ego in the mode of ignorance. And all powerful false ego, the first of all physical elements, merges into the total nature. The total material nature, the primary repository of the three basic modes, dissolves into the modes. These modes of nature then merges into unmanifested form of nature. And that unmanifested form merges into time. Time merges into the Supreme Lord, present in the form of the omniscient Mahapurusha, the original activator of all living beings. That origin of all life merges into me, the unborn Supreme Soul, who remains alone, established within himself, it is from him that all creation and annihilations are manifested. So here, here is a detailed description of how the absorption happened. Interestingly, while reading this, I was reminded when I was in school. I was, uh, for a very, very short while, I was in the chemistry lab. I was in the science school. And in science, uh, we learned that, um, uh, you know, we have something called a peri periodical table. And this periodical table, actually, they didn't explain it then to us. But when I was reading this, I recognized that um, whenever you go to a lab and you want to um, you want to dismantle some material thing, you have to follow the sequence of of uh, what is mentioned here. And it says here, food is merged into grains, grains merged into earth, earth merged into the sensation of fragrance, fragrance into water, water into its quality of taste, taste merges into fire, fire merges into form, form merges into touch, touch merges into ether, and ether uh, merges into sound, and it goes like that. No? So in the lab, uh, when, when somebody wants to dismantle some material thing, they have to follow in sequence like this, from earth uh, into water, water into fire, like this. It's, I thought it was very, very interesting uh, reading this. Text number 28. Just as the rising sun removes the darkness of the sky, similarly, this scientific knowledge of cosmic annihilation removes all illusion dualities from the mind of a serious student. Even if illusion somehow enters his heart, it cannot remain there. So just like I said before, this uh, chapter might seem a bit technical, but by simply listening to it, your illusion about this world around you is removed and you begin to see the world for what it is. Huh? So in the purport here, it's nicely explained. Just as the brilliant sun removes all darkness from the sky, a clear understanding of the knowledge spoken by Lord Krishna to Uddhava removes all ignorance, con 
concocted by the material mind. One will then no longer accept the material body as the self. Even if such illusionly, illu illusory temporarily manifested with, within one's consciousness, it will be driven away by the resurgence of one's spiritual knowledge. Text number 29. Thus, I, the perfect seer of everything, material and spiritual, have spoken this knowledge of Sankhya, which destroys the illusion of doubt by scientific analysis of creation and annihilation. Like in the purport, Lord Sri Krishna has explained that the material mind accepts and rejects many different concepts of life, generating innumerable false, false argument about the actual process of perfection. But a person who has taken shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead can see everything with clear intelligence. One who understands how the Supreme Lord creates and annihilates can be liberated from material bondage and devote himself to the eternal service of the Supreme Lord. So in this connection, I'd like to share with you one analogy that I just heard from, uh, from our illustrious speaker, no, Amarinda Das. He was saying that when you give a dog some food, the dog will quickly take the food and quickly just go and eat the food. He will not be bothered about who gave the food, how did it come and all that. He just wants to enjoy the food. Similarly, if, uh, if uh, 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 what a zoo handler gives food to a tiger, this tiger will see the food, but more importantly, he will see where the food is coming from. So tiger's nature is like that. The tigers are very fussy. What uh, They are fussy about where the food comes from. They want to feel secure first before they eat anything. That is the nature of the tiger. So similarly, in this material world, you will see that the, the those who are addicted to sense gratification, who want to enjoy life, so-called enjoy life, they don't care where where they get their their product of enjoyment. They just want it and they just want to enjoy it. Okay, they don't care how it comes, you know, legally or illegally, clean or not clean. They just want what they want and they just want to enjoy it. Finish. But the pure devotees of the Lord, when anything comes to them or anything taken from them, what they see is. Who is the original giver of this, of the thing that they are receiving and what is being taken away? They, they are more interested in the person, the original cause of who is giving and who is receiving. So like this, the devotees, they begin to see that everything is emanating by the mercy of Sri Krishna only. And this whole material world manifested is manifested simply for the uh, or for the opportunity for the living entity to perform loving devotional service for the pleasure of Krishna. Uh, at the end of the day, whatever so-called enjoyment you have experienced in this world, you do not take with you into your next life. Uh, whatever wealth you have, you don't take to, with you into your next life. Similarly, uh, whatever you know, name, fame you have acquired, you don't take with you into your next life. Everything is left behind. So like this, an intelligent person would... Uh, not waste his time and energy in performing activities that are not very beneficial for him. So that is the lesson in this Samkhya philosophy. Hare Krishna.